Okay, so our first, yeah, that's a good one. So our first speaker is Cami Agan, uh, who is a professor of English at Oklahoma Christian University, where she teaches British literature, including a studies in Tolkien course. Her scholarly work focuses on first age materials in the legendarium with particular interest in landscape and cultural geography. She has contributed chapters to approaches in teaching the life and works of J.R.R. Tolkien and Perilous and Fair, Law Masters and Librarians, and the forthcoming Race, Racism and Racists in Tolkien's work. Her edited collection, Cities and Strongholds of Middle-earth, is due out in 2024 later this year. Cami, welcome. No pressure for starting off this wonderful seminar, but... Am I on? Can you hear me? I'm just going to do that. Okay. Let's all um, cross our fingers communally that the book will be out later this summer. This paper has developed from weeks of close readings in my BritLit survey course, thanks to the insights of my students and to Will's call for papers. I began to see a pattern in many romantic lyrics that dovetailed interestingly with my scholarly research into all things Elvish. Ooh, I think that's okay. That pattern frequently involves representing the poet's creative impulse or the state necessary to access the imagination using images of intoxication, dream, delirium, madness, vision, and near death. These images often pair themselves with a sense of movement, outward, upward, beyond quotidian experiences to which the poet must always return. Most often, the conduit for achieving transcendence necessary for po poetic creation involves one or more of the following, an experience in nature, crossing over a spatial boundary, an altered psychological state, pulling the speaker poet out of the body or time. As the lyrics conclude, the poet speaker may question whether the experience was real or a dream, praise nature as divine, and seek to emulate the idealized experience either in thought or in rhyme. These final, often open-ended or unresolved conclusions appear to circle back to the poem itself, offering the text as a sign that the poet has indeed had a transcendent experience. On the screen, you have briefly seen passages from British romantics where images of semi-altered consciousness align magic and enchantment with inspired poetic creation. The views of the River Wye and the ruins of Tintern Abbey, the harp placed in an open window played upon by the wind, the sublime power of the sea or storm, the deep crevasses and waterfalls of the mountain, the skylark soaring ever higher, the nightingale singing at twilight. There's my boy. For the sake of time, I will narrow my discussion of this process to John Keats' poem, Ode to a Nightingale, to more fully detail the romantic lyric's ability to meditate not merely on nature, but on nature's ability to draw out the poetic imagination while that poet hovers between states of being, consciousness, and time. As I emphasize particular moments in the ode, be thinking about ways Keats's experience parallels elven encounters in Middle Earth. Although I won't have time to explore every, every line of this beautiful work, I do have the stanzas up. O2 and Nightingale begins with the poet questioning his unconsciousness in a way that bookends the last line of the poem, do I wake or sleep? The opening sense of intoxication or of drowning in sensation comes as a result of hearing the sound of the nightingale at twilight. This is the first stanza. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and lethe words had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness that thou light winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. 
in its movement, the stanza echoes the state of mind of the speaker. It shifts from self to other, from poet to subject, from my heart to thou. Hearing the nightingale song, the listener is suspended. The sensations of aching dullness, poison, intoxication come from happiness in attending to the song. In opposition to the dreaming, delirious speaker with his aching heart, the final line of the stanza emphasizes the perfection of the nightingale's full-throated ease. Indeed, indeed, Keats continues this opposition through the ode. The speaker's desire to achieve the level of poesy the bird has always been capable of. His impulse to leave the body and fly into the night with the bird, to escape this world and cross over the boundary into the shadows. And the boundaries multiply in the poem. Between Hampstead Heath and Fairylands Forlorn, between the present and the past, as in references to Dryad, Bacchus, and the sad heart of Ruth, Ruth or as so often with Keats, between life and death. And this is stanza six. Darkling, I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death. Called him soft names and many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever it seems rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Although in stanza four, the poet seeks to fly with the bird and transcend on the viewless wings of poesy, as the poem concludes, the speaker envisions the nightingale singing as he crosses the boundary from life to death. The bird ever sings, eternal unchanged. The poet has only the moment and must pass away. But he suggests, what a way to go. Keats concludes the poem with a sense of uncertainty about both his poetic ability and the experience itself. As the bird flies farther off and its song and poetry recedes into the darkness, the speaker chides himself for believing he can join her. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. The eternal perfect song cannot be matched. The viewless wings of poesy are unattainable. Finally, the speaker asks, was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? His uncanny experience, the moments of the nightingale song, leaves him only with questions. What was that? Where am I? In what state am I? These questions in some ways parallel the bird's flight. Without a concrete answer, the experience goes on. This is what I do in class, goes on. It lingers both in the asking of the question and in the words of the text itself. The experience has been otherworldly but transitory. The poem cannot match the bird's song, but it can strain for immortality. Finally, the poet questions the experience, inspiration, and reality itself. There is a sense of transformation in the speaker attending to the nightingale, and we mimic the poet's attempts at aesthetic flight in our own reading of the poem. While the connection between Tolkien's on fairy stories and Coleridge's literary criticism is ground very well covered, see Chris Seaman and David Sander, for example, I seek to explore how fairy in Tolkien echoes romantic impulses such as those we've just explored in Keats's Ode. Specifically, four beings within the secondary world. I am by no means unique in seeing the connection between Keats's sense of fairy and Tolkien's construction of fairy spaces in his legendarium. Scholars such as Julian Eilman noted both Keats's fascination with folkloric imagery, the fairy world, and Tolkien's familiarity with Keats and the more general romantic impulse to assert poetic creation as a sublime and holy act. Angelica Verandas suggests that, quote, fairy tales met the taste of the romantic authors fascinated by all that was distant, exotic, mythical, poetic, beautiful and dreamy. Barandas also points out that, quote, as a fantasy writer and as an academic, Tolkien resorted to the Middle Ages with the same objective as his romantic predecessors, concluding that Tolkien's legendarium allows access to a time and place when myth carried the weight of cultural value in a pre-industrial golden age with at times a nationalist purpose. Our own Will Sherwood, in fact, just gave a paper at Keats' house 
linking Tolkien's fairy spaces with Keats' La Belle Dame sans merci, grounding his reading in Christine Gallant's observation that Keats used fairy lore as much as classicism, and with reference to the great Dimitri Fimi's work on Tolkien and Celtic myth, Sherwood develops his excellent reading of fairy temporality in Keats and Tolkien. As Sherwood notes, quote, for Keats and Tolkien, British folklore is a shared malleable literary heritage that can be revived and reinvented. They draw on the same folkloric motifs. In her reading of O to a Nightingale, Cynthia Chase suggests the work, quote, richly gratifies that wish for beauty that impels us to ascribe epistemological authority to the aesthetic, to presume the continuity of perception with knowledge, and that, quote, the, old, the ode represents its own act as an act of listening. Chase's observation that Keats's work seeks to yoke while at the same time to question knowledge and formal beauty through the process of attending to song could almost be imported directly into my reading of Tolkien's episodes of Elven Wonder. Encounters with Elvish aesthetic impart a similar response in Arda to what we've seen in the ode, awe, wonder, and a sense of transformation. Although Sandner speaks of the reader, his observation also applies to the peoples within the secondary world. Quote, nobody returns from fairy unchanged. Just as the experience with the nightingale led to the poem Ode to a Nightingale, encounters with Elvish song and creation lead to the tales and texts of Tolkien's legendarium that survive in his secondary world. Among the clearest first stage examples of elven portals, Finrod's discovering the men of the house of Beor, Tuor's entrance into Gondolin, Baron's enchantment at the site of Luthien. In these instances, elven art, enchantment, craft, sparks a vision, often described in terms of dreamlike states or a kind of numinous experience that alters and expands the Adine who take part in it. Moments in The Lord of the Rings that evoke the romantic poet's process may be easier to trace partly because of the time that has passed since the first age, with fewer elves, alas, wandering about, as well as because of the text's focus on hobbits experiencing the wide world. Likewise, the direct link between the romantic portal and the creativity that results from that transcendent moment comes in the form of the work itself, translated and written later by Bilbo, Frodo, and Sam. These moments in particular stand out. The Hobbit's encounter with Gildor at Woodhall, the Hall of Fire in Rivendell, and Frodo's impressions of Lothlorien. For time's sake, I will focus on the Woodhall episode only. In my article, Song as Mythic Conduit in the Fellowship of the Ring, I noted how the encounters with High Elves feature the transformative power of song that allows Frodo to sight later in the moments, the dark moments of his quest. Today, I'd like to think about how those transformative moments also align with the familiar romantic techniques I've established from Keats, natural or uncanny space, loss of consciousness, dream, intoxication, questions about the experience, and a creative outflow as a result of that experience. So this is the passage from Woodhall. There came a sound like mingled song and laughter. Clear voices rose and fell in the starlit air. The black shadows straightened up and retreated. Elves, exclaimed Sam in a hoarse whisper. Elves, sir. It was singing in the fair elven tongue of which Frodo only knew a little and the others knew nothing. Yet the sound blending with the melody seemed to shape itself in their thoughts into words which they only partly understood. Suddenly they came out of the shadows of the trees and before them lay a wide space of grass, gray under the night. By some shift of airs, all the mist was drawn away like a veil, and there leaped up Menel Vagor with his shining belt. All the elves burst into song. Pippin afterwards recalled little of either food or drink, a shocker for a hobbit, for his mind was filled with the light upon the elf faces and the sound of voices so various and so beautiful that he felt an awaking dream. He drained a cup that was filled with a fragrant draught, cool as a clear fountain, golden as a summer afternoon. Sam could never describe in words nor picture clearly himself what he felt or thought that night. If I could grow apples like that, I would call myself a gardener. But it was the singing that went to my heart. 
While the encounter with Gildor reads as an experience with fairy in the traditional medieval sense, it also echoes the romantic techniques mapped out in the ode. In the dark, the hobbits hear song and laughter. The music and song of the elves enchants the hobbits so that they see images of the song in their own minds. Once at Woodhall, the hobbits pass through a natural space and sense the lifting of a veil, wonder at the uncanny light from the elves. Pippin's sense of a waking dream duplicates Keats's do I wake or sleep, and his description of the draught of wine suggests the very same vintage that Keats calls for as a pathway for joining the singing bird. Twice in the passage, there is an association between the stars and the songs of the elves. With the encounter the hobbits have with the Eldar, the elves themselves also respond to the natural world around them. The appearance of the stars evokes the song, and naming the constellation here, Menel Vagor on the bottom, harkens back to Varda's creation of the stars at the time of the elves' awakening, and to their particular love of the star kindler. Further, several later episodes, including the two I reference, feature Frodo's linking story and song with the stars. And of course, he and Sam will later invoke Elbereth as their password at the darkest moments in the quest. Gildor and the High Elves save the hobbits from the hunting Black Riders who nearly seize them before the power of the elven song under stars drives them away. However, the episode also offers them a transcendent aesthetic experience that the text takes time to detail. The hobbits cross from the everyday woodlands into an enchanted natural space made more beautiful by art. The songs of the elves works with and embellishes the beauty of Woodhall. They do not wander unknowingly into a perilous realm of fairy as in a medieval lay, but rather elven song helps them cross into a space of safety and delight. The framing of the last part of the passage also suggests the later creative impulse that results in the tale itself, the tale we are reading. Written in the past tense, Pippin afterwards recalled and Sam could never describe in words, the passage suggests that Pippin and Sam recount the later experience later to a person, we assume Frodo, who preserves the experience in a text. It also reveals that they survive the quest to recall and recount the experience, and for someone to preserve it. As Ode to a Nightingale does, this experience points back to the text, The Lord of the Rings, suggesting a creative power that, while it cannot equal the elven song, results from that elvish inspiration. Although it comes early in a quest that will feature horrific, monstrous, inspiring encounters, the evening with Gildor at Woodhall stays with the hobbits even beyond the great victory to become a part of the larger story. Particularly in the Fourth Age, as so many of the Eldar pass over into the West or fade from view, the transfer of song and story that began with humans in the First Age now stretches to hobbits, who may carry the stories and songs of the Elder Days, as well as their own continuation of that story in the War of the Ring. Those who come into contact with the Eldar not only an experience and enchantment that extends their consciousness beyond the mundane to the more perfected art, but they also now possess the ingredients of story from the past that they may fold into their own created works. Although they may not attain the enchanted art of elves, the power of the immortal bird of Keats, they can subcreate and keep the stories with their love of the natural world and their possibilities for great deeds and even victory alive. Thank you. What a strong start. Thank you so much, Cami, okay. for uh, that paper. And thank you for the quotations. <laughs> I, it's strange to see, see me up there, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so if you are online at the moment, then please use the Q&A function to ask Cami a question. I'll be, oh, we do have a question there already. So we're gonna go online. Okay. Make sure I can read it. Uh, okay, so in the wood hole portion, uh, where Tolkien uses fair elven that Tolkien states Frodo only knew little of. That is presumably Quenya. Do you consider Tolkien's use of fair there to be romanticizing Quenya and it's linked to the heroic past of the elves? I'm looking right at Andy. He'll help me with that if I need. 
need to, I, I think that is starting a nice trail because also in the passage, Gildor specifically identifies himself, right, as a high elf, as one of the Noldor, and Frodo also comments on that. So absolutely, we have at least two interweavings there, the um, the hobbits interweaving their story with the past and the elves also recognizing that past by using that language. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Keep keep. <laughs> the Ellen Sila Lumen Omotolivio greeting, basically, that he gives, which actually gets wrong because it's Omotolivio, but anyway. But but yes, but that is how that is how they recognize the fact that Gildor is a Noldor and that is an exiled elf, basically. Yeah. And it's the first time that you hear Elvish, again, that idea of going into a, a element of fairy and you hear oh. Elvish for the first time. Yeah. And, and then Frodo identifies that. So we know that he's already somewhat steeped in that process of learning. Because Bilbo's taught him some yeah. Elvish and stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent paper, by the way. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, okay, have we got any questions from the room? Yes. Going to do so much running today. Cami, it's a wonderful paper. I, um, that. I was particularly intrigued by two images that you used. One was the image of the portal. Mm -hmm. You talked about some moments in the first age and, and in the second age, and then you focused on the Woodhall episode. Um, and, you know, normally we think of portal, particularly in fantasy, is a literal sort of stepping through mm -hmm. to another world. Yep. And here it's more of a metaphoric one. Yeah. You have these two kinds of um, spaces sort of coexisting in mm -hmm. space. Yeah. And then you also brought up the idea of time and how mm -hmm. when they sort of step through this portal into yeah. this, again, not exactly physically, but metaphorically into this coexisting space it moves into a, a space where time almost feels untethered yes. right and mm -hmm. i just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the connection between time and space there yes and and time was um certainly will's emphasis in in his paper in at keats house i think the sense of hovering or suspension applies to both um so when you move out of time through the song in this case you also may be at Woodhall, which is identifiable, I assume, to any hobbit, but also you're in the somewhere else place that, as a medieval, we would say is fairy, right? As, as Tolkien would also say, um, so that you are, right? Is this a vision or a waking dream? Do I wake or sleep? So you have the, the question of, I, I hang above both of those um, measurements of existence. And in that time, this inspiration can flow through me. What I think is interesting is that the early experience lasts so long for them that it makes it into the text. Um, and so they're able to sort of reinscribe it into time and place in the text by identifying it, but also give you a sense of the transcendent moment, waking dream. Um, you also have methods through crossing the portal, the song of the elves, but also the food and drink, which I didn't have time to explore, but I think that's also a possibility, just like the draught would help Keats, right, escape. So absolutely the two work in tandem, or there's also a term in the encyclopedia of fantasy called cross hatching, right? So instead of I'm here and then I'm here, it's right that the the worlds are like this. And so at any moment you could cross over in space and by extension time. Yeah, great question. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Oh, excellent, yes. Um, and coming, actually, yes. I'm just going to jump off that. So you were talking Good. about... Um, food and drink mm -hmm. as kind of like it's an additional part of that and yeah. Keats's La Belle dans Sans Merci mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just about the sound of her song but also right. um, the the food and the drink that the knight at arms or the wretched white depending yes. on which version you look at mm -hmm. that's part of that yes as well so, so I was posed literally the same question by someone I was like I love no that yet. I love that because that that takes us to a bit of a darker potential in which um, you want to partake of the food and drink, in this case, of uh, Gildor and his folk. But also, also, there's an element of danger should you take part of the food and drink of the fairy world. Um, so you're sort of plunging yourself in it and taking a kind of risk as well. 
just as losing a sense of space and time is also somewhat unnerving at the same time that, that it is also transcendent. Oh, two questions. Um, we do have a question online. So, um, Christine, I'll come to you next after our online one. Okay, so, uh, Cami, uh, so given the Hall of Fire experience, Frodo has uh, his song um, through an elven portal, and in their song of Elbereth, does Gildor's party frighten the Black Rider by being a portal? Oh, fantastic question. I didn't consider that in my, you know, 10 years or more old article um, about that moment. Um, but I did assert that the elves actually had the power to drive them away. That it wasn't just like, oh, we'll come back later, but it's an actual supernatural power. So why not also be an opening of a portal? I think that's the, the obvious next step for sure. Great. Yeah. Great paper, Cammie. Thank course. you. Um, Tolkien very intentionally and carefully and correctly, thank you, Tolkien, <laughs> describes the rising of Orion up. Mm -hmm. And so you have that sense of, of time, space, and motion. Excellent. And as, it's, as you're leaping from the terrestrial to the celestial, can you comment about that and this movement into the yes. fairy realm? Yes, and that paragraph on the stars was for you. I thought, you know, she'll never forgive me if I don't mention the stars because I think that's part of this cross-hatching. So as the bird in Keats like, flies off into the shadows, right, the rising of right, Manel Vagor is signaling the moment in time. And I especially like the fact that the elves themselves are transported by the experience. It's not just the hobbits who are having the experience, but Varda, for, for lack of a better term, right, is, is showing them this ultimate portal. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Cami. Great paper. Thank I've you. always thought it's interesting with the encounter with Gildor, thinking about resonances. If you compare that in the Book of Lost Tales with Ariel's first encounter with the elves, because mm -hmm. he has to go into a liminal space. Yes. He actually has to get small to go. And there's a lot of food. There's a lot mm -hmm. of eating. There's limpe, which is a scary food to eat. <laughs> Do you want to just, I, I mean, I'm just thinking again about romantic resonances and I'm just wondering yep. if Tolkien was carrying some of that forward from what he originally developed with the Book of Lost Tales period. I think so. And I'm, I'm hoping Will will agree with me that I feel like what ends up being in Fellowship of the Ring is actually more romantic than the Lost Tales episode. It, that feels more traditionally folkloric, medieval, and this feels like a, a nice melange of both. Um, but that's just sort of my sense in in listening to the question. 